Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of current and classic horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews and discussions may include spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. For today's episode of Daily Horror Habit, I'm taking a look at Stephen Kostansky's 2020 film Psycho Goreman, which is currently available on Video On Demand, Hoopla Digital, and is coming to Shudder on May 20th. Psycho Goreman follows brother and sister Luke and Mimi, who discover a gem that grants them control over the horrific monster lovingly named Psycho Goreman, which is convenient given that a group of intergalactic assassin monsters arrive shortly to wreak havoc on Earth. And joining me today to chat all things Psycho, Gore, and Heart is returning friend of the show and host of the Killer Horror Critic podcast, Matt Kanapka. Matt, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Jay. Good to be here, man. No problem. We had such a great chat last time about John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, so I thought we would talk about one of your favorite films of 2021 so far that just got to recently revisit, and I enjoyed it even more the second time, and it's a film that I can definitely see myself revisiting and once it's safe to, like, showing to friends and having people over that, even if they aren't necessarily, like, the biggest of horror fans, I find Mm -hmm. that Psycho Gorman is one of those movies that everybody can have some level of fun with. And, of course, if you're a horror fan like us, you get kind of the best of both worlds, right? The practical gore and sanity and then the humor. So I'm excited to talk about it with you today. Oh, for sure, yeah. You know, and, and I will just say, to me, it's not just one of the best movies of 2021. It is the heckin' best. <laughs> <laughs> it's the heckin' best film of 2021 so far, in my opinion. Because just like what you said, man, like this movie is just so beyond entertaining you know it takes everything that i think you know us as kids enjoyed in horror movies and saturday morning cartoons and stuff like that and just combines it all into one just great big blood fest (laughs) uh and yeah i'm with you i can't wait to just show this film at uh you know any kind of like watch parties or having people over and expose them to the greatness that is psycho (laughs) gorman Absolutely. Yeah. And I I was kind of skeptical a little bit just because of how going into the film, I was such a huge fan of uh, Kostansky's previous film, which he helped co-direct, which was The Void, right? Which was very Mm -hmm. much this like love letter to Carpenter, practical effects, cosmic horror. And then I heard that he was going to do more of a horror comedy for his next film. And I immediately, and I mean, this is my personal thing. I'm not the biggest fan of horror comedies in a lot of ways, because most Mm -hmm. of the time I'm like, well, it's either going to lean into one camp more than the other, that being like the horror influence or the comedy influence. And I loved, I loved his horror sensibility. So I was like, oh, is that going to be super watered down? And then as we both know with Psycho Goreman, it, if anything, it gets cranked up to like 11 in terms of <laughs> the practical yeah. gore and his ability to really kind of incorporate that into humor, I think is really remarkable. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, it's funny. I, I got so I, I've spoken to Kostansky before about this film, and I got the sense that, you know, I got the sense that he enjoyed The Void because The Void was kind of like a step out of their comfort zone. You know, so it, so anyone who's not as familiar with Kostansky, you know, he also uh, he also made films such as like Manborg was one of their earlier ones. And, <laughs> you know, he, he typically does stuff like Psycho Goreman that's just these kind of really ridiculous over the top just goofy movies right and the void was something where you know they wanted to step out of that comfort zone do something a little different and i got the sense that like as much as they as much as he enjoyed that and learned from it you know it it definitely it seemed that maybe he felt like it wasn't quite for him or he wanted to go back to what was comfortable right and then he did leprechaun returns before this and you got the sense that that was just basically like his, you know, his studio gig, right? Like it's working for somebody else instead of for himself. So anyway, what I'm getting to is Psycho Gorman just kind of feels like this film where, you know, it's like he maybe felt a bit constrained, I guess, for a couple of years. And Psycho Gorman is just kind of like this explosion of, <laughs> you know, just everything because Nancy wanted to be doing at the time, put in the one movie. <laughs> That's a really great way to put it and just how unrestrained the film is. And yet for as sort of like chaotic and this fantastic blending of different genre influences, the film feels very, just very focused in the specific sort of unique 
quirky style that it has and it being so fluid and moving in between sort of the humor and the horror elements like we've kind of been saying. So I'm curious for you with Psycho Goreman, what is really the most defining element that makes that a standout for you for your uh, most favorite heckin' best uh, film of 2021? What's the sort of element that jumps out to you the most? Oh, well, I mean, just just speaking from a fan's perspective, you know, I think the thing that stands out to me the most is just the the ambition of it and the passion that goes into the monsters, you know? So, so like, when you look at this movie, uh, you know, something that really appeals to me that I just don't feel like you see enough of in the genre these days are these, you know, practical effects, uh, guy or woman in a rubber suit monster, right? Just walk in the streets of some random suburban neighborhood. And you just don't really get a lot of that period in horror now. You know, a lot of times you see a, a blend of digital and practical effects. You don't really see these kind of guy in a rubber suit monster movies anymore, right? They're kind of considered old hat. And, you know, a lot of filmmakers and studios won't really touch that anymore. <laughs> and uh, so, so, so that was something that stood out to me immediately is not just the fact that you have the Psycho Gorman character being presented that way, but that this movie is just packed full of, you know, aliens and monsters that, you know, have that old guy in a rubber suit aesthetic from the 80s and 90s. And it, going along with that, you know, I love that, I love that it is just this big homage to the 90s Saturday morning cartoons and stuff like Power Rangers or Guyver, you know, where it's it's larger than life characters in mundane settings. You know, that was something that Costanzi talked about with me and that he really wanted to accomplish because apparently he's a big fan of, uh, you know, stuff like Masters of the Universe and things like that. These These projects that want to be bigger than they have the budget for, right? So it's like something like Masters of the Universe, you know, you got all these big characters, but they're like fighting in suburban streets and things like that. And so that that was a feeling that he wanted to replicate with Psycho Gorman is having like these larger than life characters, but they're having, you know, these big epic bloody battles like in your backyard, right? You know, just it's not we're not we're not seeing it on, you know, on like the planet Gygax or something like that. It's like right outside, you know, and it, that was just something I really love. Like it, it really does feel like what he wanted to accomplish, which is this you know, E.T. meets just like the most violent monster movie you can imagine. Uh, and so I just really dig that. It's just this great blend of, you know, fun family comedy, but with a ton of gore. <laughs> yeah. And I think that what's so remarkable about it is that how many like there have been plenty of filmmakers before that have tried to emulate or make a homage to past decades, right? Kind of capture that sort of like 90s sensibility in terms of like the Saturday morning energy um, or even just again like a love of practical effects and trying to replicate it in a way that whenever they try to do it I feel like a majority of the time it ends up looking cheap or it ends up sort of being very one note right like maybe if somebody wants to make a monster movie or sort of like a uh, heavily uh, influenced like creature movie a lot of the time maybe the designs will be very sort of like one note, right? It'll be a lot of different things, but they all are sort of cut from the same cloth. Whereas with this film, Psycho Goreman, it's so impressive to me how not a single creature or monster looks like a copy of another one. Everybody right. looks like they have this ent their entire backstory you can almost tell from the way that they look. And you can kind of begin to derive certain things from their design and how, again, like nobody looks the same. Nobody looks like a carbon copy of them. And I think mm. that that is really a testament to like, his love of practical effects and of monster designs and having that really unique variety because, I mean, it could have been so easy just to have all the effort going to designing Psycho Gore Man and then you have the bug alien, you have the robot. And while you do have like bug type aliens and robots, there's so much more articulation to them and so much more detail. And you can really, again, like start to craft your own narrative for their backstories, even though of course they never really delve into it. But that is an element that I think is what makes the horror element of the film so strong and never really be diluted by the comedy. Because again, that's like one of my fears is that the comedy elements will dilute the horror elements in a horror comedy. But with this, it's so strong. And again, it's all wrapped up into that sort of 90s cartoon Saturday morning energy that um, the film 
kind of capitalizes on so well. It's it's funny that you say that because uh, you know so so the Blu-ray for the film is out right now, and it, I, I've listened to I, I've gone through the entire thing, and uh, I've listened to the commentary. And something that stood out to me there is that Kostansky, Kostansky all throughout is kind of shitting on himself, you know, and, and basically talking about how he tends to go full stupid with a lot of moments in the movie. But, but one thing he said that, that stuck out to me is he says, you know, at some point I have to dial back the stupid to make something resembling a movie. <laughs> and I, I feel like that just kind of speaks to what you're saying in just the sense that, you know, at, at some point, you have to take certain elements seriously and it can't all just be the comedy, right? And I think that's where a lot of horror comedies go wrong is that, you know, they they tend to, I think they tend to get too focused on the comedy and the sort of wink wink nature towards the audience, right? And it, to me, it always works best when you're playing it straight and in the moments where it needs to be played straight, you know? And so that that's something that Psycho Gorman does do well is that, even though you know there's all this like over the top uh characters and elements to it there's still a lot of heart and like genuine terror at the times where you need those feelings totally agree in that because it really does have that fantastic ebb and flow and continually throughout the movie i always and even on rewatches i still feel like they're about to lean too far with the humor sometimes or kind of just like keep returning to the same things but then they always he always backs away just enough that you can have one of those moments that, again, kind of captures the relationship between the kids, Luke and Mimi, or their relationship with Psycho Goreman, or even their parents. Right. Um, and they also do such a great job of really breaking up the Psycho Goreman lore and like his backstory and uh, Planet Gygax and all these things and the council and all of these different elements. But they sprinkle it throughout the film. So, of course, like it's a 90 minute movie, but it feels so much brisker than it is. And it feels like a movie that is longer than it actually is in the sense that you feel like you have such a understanding of kind of like the world and the parameters of that thing to the degree that other than like how iconic Psycho Gorman looks, he feels like he is a horror icon from the moment that he shows up on screen. And that's something that I think is incredibly rare. This completely fiction, uh, obviously fictionalized, but a character that was <laughs> created in the film, just you would think that this is like the third or fourth character or third or fourth film in his series just by the way he kind of carries himself and this idea that you can feel like he has this legacy behind him almost as if he's like a pinhead or somebody to that extent yeah well i mean you know matthew miniver who plays psycho Gorman, does have a really great presence about himself you know he i mean he just walks in like he owns the scene and you know when you've got when you've got an introduction to a character who you know our very first moment with him is straight up ripping two guys heads off with his bare hands <laughs> yeah. and uh and you know talking about bathing in their blood and shit like that <laughs> like you know it, it stands out right away like to me psycho Gorman, he's he's every cartoon villain that you ever grew up with except you get to see that villain actually doing horrible villainous things right, right. <laughs> uh you know because like we all grew up with those characters but because they're cartoons you know they can only go so far and so you know, when you when you grow up with something like that and you get this character, Psycho Gorman, coming in and actually getting to do what you always kind of imagine those characters doing, <laughs> uh, it, it just stands out immediately. You know, it's like um, like a big one for me was Ninja Turtles with Shredder, right? And you look at Shredder and you're like, man, that guy could probably fuck some people up. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you don't really, you never really experience that. And so to me, I think, you know, Psycho Gorman coming out and just right away ripping heads off and stuff like that. <laughs> It tells you that this movie is going to be everything you ever wanted as a kid for the next 90 minutes, you know? So I, I think that's why he just immediately stands out. But something I wanted to go back to is, you know, you mentioned how all the creatures have just this really unique look to them and and feel like their own thing. And to me, that's, that's what's beyond impressive about Kostiansky is that you know, everything was basically designed by him, his assistant, and one of the producers. And, and they built all of these creatures themselves. You know, this is a low budget movie. And it, and so it's a, a lot of it's being done, you know, just long hours, a few people working on it. And in this case, like it was just a few people that built all those <laughs> and put them together. And it, and that was kind of something that he mentioned to me as well is that, you know, he, he tends to have this, 
he tends to be a little bit too ambitious, you know, where it's like, you've only got so much money, but he doesn't really give a shit. And he just wants to throw everything he wants in the movie in there anyway. <laughs> um, so I think it's just, you're, you're, cause Nancy just has like a, a kind of like unmatched passion for this sort of thing that I think comes through in the work, like you said, where you can just, you can tell that he's a fan who wants to do something special for the people watching the movie, you know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I was reading the interview that you did with him and he kind of talked about wanting to deliver on like the true potential of a movie poster, right? This idea that when you yep. would see movie posters from whatever, 80s and 90s or something like that, you would see these kind of like fantastical posters that are larger than life. But then when you actually got into the movie, it would be like, okay, maybe the all of their ambition came out on the poster and yet what they're actually able to actually film didn't quite live up to that. And this is really one of those films that absolutely like 100% does. And I guess I'm thinking of the um, the poster that they did, not the one for the DVD cover or the Blu-ray cover, but the one that has all the different types of monsters on it, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, you not only get to see all of the monsters, obviously, that are on the poster in the film, but you get to see them for more than like five seconds or something, right? I mean, how many right. times have we ever seen in a trailer or on the poster something you're like, oh, that looks awesome. And then when you get to see the movie, it's in there for like 60 seconds. Whereas... Right. In this, there are so many fantastic scenes with all these creatures and they get to actually like have their own moment, right? We have that awesome fight scene in the woods when you've got five or six different types of monsters duking it out with Psycho Gorman as the kids are like shouting in the background and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I just, again, it is it is very remarkable how he's able to really just have this this creativity that that clearly he channels through his love of obviously horror, but then also just monsters and fantasy in general. And everything is able to have its own sort of identity or it has its own moment to shine. It's not no. sort of, he is able to breeze past the sort of like generic nature of monsters sometimes, I feel like when mm -hmm. filmmakers maybe, they try to take on to more than they can actually sort of achieve in a lot of ways. It's not just like guys swinging their arms in rubber suits. It's <laughs> you get to see full well, displays of different types of powers and things like that. Well, I think, you know, to, to me, it's it's generally pretty easy to tell the difference between a filmmaker who has a strong passion for monsters and one who maybe doesn't as much, right? And and Kostansky, you know, that, that was something too that caught my eye with Psycho Gorman before it even released is that, um, I don't know who remembers this, but they had a whole Twitter campaign going for like months before the film had its premiere here. And, it, you know, this campaign was basically just Every once in a while, they would drop a, a new photo of one of the creatures, uh, usually from the Gygax Council, right? They would drop, they would drop one of these photos, and they would have like a whole bio to go along with the character of like who they are, what they're about, what they do, you know. And and I was just watching that, and I'm like, man, they he really put as much thought as possible into this, like, because because you. Because when you watch the film, I mean, the Gygax Council characters, you know, they're, they get all of like five minutes of screen time, maybe, right? But you end up remembering all of them for exactly the reasons that you're saying is that it felt like each one was given their own backstory, their personality. They, they all kind of have like their moment, right? Um, like, I don't, I don't know the name of the character, but there's one that's a bit more robotic. And when Pandora crushes that poor woman who was just <laughs> yanked out of like her bed i'm guessing in the middle of the night to show up at this council and crushes her into that blood cube you know uh the robot character his his jaw just like drops and and it's just such a nothing moment but it's something that stands out like you remember it right um and yeah no that exactly like that that was something that it's clear he wanted to do is like he, he he's got this title psycho gorman he's got this poster full of monsters and he wanted to make sure that if you're a kid picking up that, you know, picking up that movie at, unfortunately, Blockbuster and stuff like that doesn't exist anymore. But if you're that kid picking up that movie based on the poster, you are going to get exactly what that poster's promised. <laughs> yeah, I think the best way you can compliment like a movie that has lots of monsters and creatures and things is like, think about all the action figures that if they had the financing that they could actually make and they would be right. viable, right? It would be each and every one of those characters could literally be their own action figure and they stand out and they're obviously very, uh, they're defined differently than all the other ones. And it's not this sort of like the same p color palette or the same types of armor or anything generic like that. But I mean, what I really love too is, is that he's even able to take his sort of like adult swim sensibilities with a lot of humor. And he's able to inject that into the more 
sort of like monster action moments, right? I mean, right. when they when Gorman is having that fight in the woods, there's that one um, one of his old like team members that I think his name is Death Trapper, who is mm. literally just like a big tub that is filled with like dead <laughs> bodies, and then he just squirts blood everywhere, and it's like. There's no reason that he should be in this sort of like super league group of people that kill thousands of people and all these things. But just his being there and just squirting blood aimlessly is like a hilarious moment that it doesn't really linger on that moment longer than it should. Again, like he has such a great handling on humor that he gets just enough in for a joke and then he moves on to another element of the film that he... Uh... I, I mean, to me, that's part, that's part of the genius of his comedy, right? Is that... You know, on the surface, you have this story again of like, I keep saying larger than life, I'm sorry, but like you have this, you know, these, these larger than life characters, right? And it's supposed to be epic. And you've got like this, you know, Psycho Gorman, this like monster of the universe, right? And like, it's all supposed to be big and amazing. And, you know, and it, to me, those moments feel like kind of a commentary on that genre itself of these kind of masters in the universe type stories where, you know, they're they're presented as just these big epic stories, but then he occasionally pulls back from that for just a moment to show you like, no guys, this is this is just silly and fun. <laughs> and, and that's yeah, I love that fight. Um I was just watching that earlier today where it's just, yeah, you've got, you know, the the soundtrack's playing. I, I love the score in this film and it, you've just got like that booming and everyone's fighting, and then all of a sudden we pull back for just a second. The music cuts out and we just see what's his face spraying blood like a goof right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah exactly what you said it's like why is why is this thing a part of <laughs> this group but it doesn't matter because we're having fun so <laughs> this is true yeah and i mean psycho gorman like he is a joke in of itself right this idea that yeah. you're taking the most powerful being in the universe and you're essentially neutering him by not yeah, being able to by a child <laughs> yeah, he's being controlled by a child and they're like degrading him by making him like run in place or sit there until they get back like these little yeah. things that he never allows the film to take itself too seriously not that i think he has that sensibility about him but i could see how if you start to leave behind the humor for too long you might have the appearance of being like this is a straight up monster horror movie but he never really allows us to forget that and i think that that really comes through a lot with the two kids and his relationship with them and how there is the real heartfelt moments in this movie, even if the kids are bastards to one another periodically in these things and they're like just taking shots at each other and people around them and you have like these zombie cops that are shooting themselves in the head and the stuff in the background. You have all these moments that are so bizarre, but then he's able to conjure up like real genuine emotion between these characters in a way that I find to be very refreshing in terms of his Again, just never allowing this chaotic larger-than-life film with larger-than-life creatures and things to ever really to run off the rails, as it were. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, um, it's it's one of the things that that I think works so well for the film is, you know, you were talking earlier about how there there are a lot of films that try to do these homages that don't end up succeeding in the end. And I think part of the reason that Sergeant Gorman does so well is Kostansky despite despite all of the ridiculousness of it despite all of the gore and the practical effects and the monsters he manages to humanize the story uh with the characters of Mimi and Luke because you know to me like on the surface the story of this film is okay we've got this little girl who you know finds a gem that controls a big bad monster right and that's and that's the story we're presented but underneath it you know the to me the kind of core in the heart of Psycho Gorman is that it's really this movie about this little girl Mimi who is kind of discovering that you know she's lonely because people think that she's a fucking monster <laughs> yeah. and, and and she's kind of like having to come to terms with that a little bit and to me the kind of genius of Kostansky is he doesn't lean so far into that that it kind of takes away from the rest of the film because by the end you know Mimi is still kind of a monster <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you know there's that great kind of speech I think where the dad's going off about something they've learned and, or, or Psycho Gorman goes off about something that he's learned and everybody else is like what the fuck are you talking about yeah. <laughs> you know that's like the joke there's all these family movies they try to present some kind of lesson in the end and <laughs> and in this case it's just like yeah we didn't really learn anything but, but you still have uh, this really human story with Mimi where it's like she isn't perfect by the end but she goes through this journey of, of realizing 
okay, maybe I should treat my family a little bit better sometimes. <laughs> you know, because because her and Sugu Orman are basically one and the same character. It's just that he has superpowers and she doesn't, right? So, but she would beat him if she could. <laughs> But I think it kind of just circling back again to like Psycho Goreman and the presence that he has when he comes into when we meet him. I mean, he again, he's a character that feels like this is his second or third film in a series. And he has that sort of like legacy behind him, even though we've only just met him. And that's something that is because that's a big risk, right? Because if that character doesn't come off that way, then the film loses a lot of the sort of like horror allure that's behind that character, right? Because we instantly are fearful of him. We see what he does to a bunch of, a group of homeless people that he just kind of stumbles upon. And first thing he does is knock off some heads. And then slowly we're trickling out like this backstory and we're learning more about him. But I'm just so impressed again with how well that character really holds up in terms of just instantly feeling iconic. And yet being neutered right after that, we see him kill those guys. He's just, oh, he's now he's being controlled by a child. But he still never truly loses that sinister nature, right? He still is saying things like, one of the lines that I really liked was he says something like, oh, I wish you would die or something like that. He's got these nasty comebacks and the yet- kids are walking away and they're like, have a good day. And he's like, it'd be better if you were dead. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, why, it's why I think he, he's such a likable character is that again, you know, you're, I, I'm, I'm struggling so bad to think of some of the villains I grew up with that I'm trying to compare him to, but, um, but you know, he, it's just so much fun to watch someone like that or a creature like that be neutered and have and still maintain that sinister nature though because like you said all throughout even though he's not being allowed to do what he wants he's still saying what he wants to he's still saying what he's thinking and it, like one of my favorite moments is when um is when the parents discover him and they run out and mimi's like no no don't worry he's he's not gonna hurt you he's not gonna kill anybody he's like I will kill you, I will kill you, I will kill you. <laughs> or, or like, Ron, I will bathe in your blood, you know? It's just like, it it, it bring, it, to me, it, it's shining a light on like how just kind of ridiculous those characters really are. The ones that are all about, you know, uh, violence and like, and just the kind of lines that they would have in those old cartoons, right? Like the bathe in your blood thing. <laughs> it just, it, it endears you to the characters so much because it's like, um, I don't know. It's almost like Freddy Krueger, but if he had a friend, I don't know <laughs> how to say it. Well, it's an interesting balance to strike with a character, right? Because if we, if there isn't that sort of likability to this supposed to be like this mass murder in the galaxy or whatever, then our relationship, obviously the, his relationship with the kids is different, but then also our relationship with him is different. And we don't get those heartfelt moments where he's going out and trying on lots of different clothing and doing like a rock band and things like that. Like those moments lose a lot of that if it is someone like a Freddy Krueger, I think. You know what I think it is? It's um, it's this idea that like, you know, so, so a lot of us kids, if you grew up with horror, you grew up maybe kind of feeling more connected to the monster, right? Uh, like I know I did. I always kind of saw myself as like the outcast, right? So, so anytime I saw something like Frankenstein's monster being chased by the mob with torches, right? I was always more kind of feeling for the monster than I was the people with the torches. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think with Psycho Goreman, I think it's, you know, the movie's doing a great job of kind of capturing that feeling of how we do kind of see ourselves in the monster sometimes. Again, with the, the relationship between Mimi and Psycho Goreman and how I think she probably sees a lot of herself in him, just like he probably sees the same in her right um but I, but I think I think a big part of what endears us to him is that is that for for all the power that he has all the you know all, all the big talk that he delivers he's still not perfect you know he still he still makes mistakes he still fucks up <laughs> he still there's still things that he doesn't understand right um like you get a lot of moments all throughout this of psycho gorman just like you know he gets lost on the way to Mimi's house <laughs> Uh, or he doesn't understand the crazy ball game, you know, just all these little things that kind of pop up where for just a brief moment, it allows the audience to be like, oh yeah, you might be this super powerful being, but you're still like me, you still mess up. That's a really great way to kind of like humanize this monster and that, yeah, you can be this uh, 
this all-powerful being, and yet you can still struggle with the same things that every no normal day people do, whether it be like the kids or the parents and things like that. I think that's a great exactly. that's a great comparison, and kind of also it's just interesting in thinking about how he's able again to really like make this a very personable tale about a monster and then have it do horrific things. And then the next moment you're laughing along with it at some horrific line where it's like, I want to kill you. I want to kill you. I want to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Little things like that. And again, it's just his ability to really seamlessly sort of blend these things into one another and then never really miss a beat with the trajectory of the kid's tale, the parent's tale, kind of getting to know what it's like being around a monster all the time and seeing all these horrific things. I mean, it's it's a film that really never sort of outstays its welcome. Obviously, it's only 90 minutes, but at the same time, like it never really runs thin on the humor or the personable stuff. Yeah, what I, what I think is interesting is kind of go along with that is that, you know, uh, from what I understand from Kristiansky, the the image that he first thought of for the film, you know, you would think that uh, when you're concoct or when you're developing the concept for a movie like this, you would think that maybe the first image that might have popped into your head is, you know, Psycho Gorman ripping the heads off people or right. <laughs> Pandora, you know, smashing that blood cube on her face. Like you'd think maybe it's something like that. But funnily enough, you know, the the first image from my understanding that he came up with for the movie was Psycho Gorman playing on the drum set with Mimi and Luke. You know, <laughs> and and I think that. Why I why I like that is that it tells you that that is that was his main goal for the movie was that heart of the monster hanging out with his family and kind of participating in these mundane activities, right? And instead of being focused on he has to be this big badass ripping heads off, you know. So like I, I just love that because you you really get the sense all throughout that he was striving more for that monster at the drum set vibe <laughs> than he was the tearing off the heads vibe, right? That's very telling too, because I mean, think about how many, again, we were talking about like the balance of horror and comedy and horror comedy. And I mean, how many horror films have we seen where it's like, it leans too much into maybe just like the gore and that's the number one focus. And then the chief complaint is usually like, oh, there's, there's not a lot of substance to what's happening other than like these crazy brutal moments, which are great. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, you have to have a, the rest of the film to go along with those few brief moments. So if anything, to hear that he really was focusing more early on on the humor and the heart, and that being the core of the film, it really just, it gives more credence to this being a journey that is actually like relatable on some level. And then of course right. it's heightened and it's sort of complemented by all the crazy gore, which when you compare it to like, oh, this is a monster that I kind of feel for. And then you're reminded in the next 30 seconds that he, oh no, he's a monster when he's punching off people's heads or uh, <laughs> eating people whole. Like, I love that er, that we don't get early on, we don't see like Psycho Gorman's final form as it were, right? We don't see him swallowing somebody right off the bat. We almost yeah. are lulled into this false sense that like, oh, he's just like us. Like at, when he goes to the montage with the kids of the band <laughs> and all of these things. And then, no, you're reminded pretty quickly like he swallows somebody whole or he eats his plate of a food hole, these like little moments that remind you, no, he's a monster and if you forget, he's gonna eat you. <laughs> yeah, and I and I love that Kaskansky with that moment when he does first eat somebody, there, there's no shine away from it. Like he really gets you right deep and in, into the blood of that moment, you know? And, and that moment itself is horrifying, you know? Just like watching this giant mouth open and consume this person, you know? It's like, it's, it's fun in a sense if you like these kind of movies, but it's not. But he he makes sure to make that a horrific moment, right? Like he, he there's no there's no shine away from it. There's not really a lot of humor in the moment. It's it's yeah. He wants to remind you, Psycho Gorman will fuck you up if you yeah. give him a chance to. <laughs> well, it's kind of like what you were saying earlier. This idea that we all wanted to see our favorite Saturday morning villains no. go to the extreme and rip people to shreds and all of these things. And yet, of course, the nature of that being a cartoon, you'd never see that. So to see a film now that really capitalizes on that and never shies away, whether it be the horror elements or even the humor, right? I mean, you have these kids saying horrific things to one another and to each other on top of like the monsters and whatnot. Um, it really feels like it's unfiltered in the best way possible, but it's unfiltered and unrestrained without being a tr like a tryhard or being edgy or something like that. Because again, like how many 
comedies have we seen where it's like, yeah, we want to be unrestrained. And then it just ends up being like a lot of strange, edgy humor. And I mean, not every joke in the movie works for me, but overall, it's a movie that I could see. Again, we talked about who we would show this movie to. I could feel like you could show Psycho Gorman to anybody, whether they're a fan of horror or comedies. Like it's just a film that really kind of checks a lot of boxes in terms of like being an entertaining movie. And it's one that I mean, I'm definitely going to show to people when I have them over <laughs> at some well, point. Well, it's it's one of the it's one of the first things he said to me, you know, was that, and, and I and I tend to agree with this, is that, you know, he, he made the comment on how today's cinematic catalog is a little bit more cynical, you could mm-hmm. say, and and well, you know, I, I see comments occasionally where someone might say like, oh, there's there's no such thing as fun horror movies anymore, or blah blah. blah. I don't agree with that. You know, you and I were talking before the show, we agree like there's always something out there for you to find. There's always something like that being released. But I do agree that when you look at, you know, theatrical horror that's coming out, a lot of it is a bit more cynical. You know, we're, we're getting things like Hereditary and, and Us and these other movies that, you know, really just wallop you emotionally and The Invisible Man. You know, think about The Invisible Man, like the, there was a time where any Invisible Man movie coming out would have pretty much been more of like a straight up creature feature in a sense, right? Right. And and I love Lee Winnell's version of it, but it's a rough movie. You know, it's about abuse and, and male toxicity and all this stuff. Like, it's there there are things about it that are hard to watch. And and, and so Psycho Gorman, you know, it felt like Kostansky, he's talking about how he didn't want to do something like that. He wanted to kind of go back to that early 90s, 80s, you know, just fun vibe. And and that really shows through. And it's where I do think a lot of films that, where where a lot of films do kind of make that mistake, I think. You know, you mentioned edgy, like this edgy humor. And and that's something that he doesn't really do. You know, he's not, (laughs) he's not trying to be too, too like cool or dark about it, right? He's just having fun. And, And I think a good comparison is, as much as I love, you know, Batman Begins or The Dark Knight, there's no argument, there's no question that they're not nearly as fun as something like Batman Returns, you know? And, and they did kind of kick off this whole, like, sort of cynical era of the superhero film for a bit. <laughs> um, so, so Psycho Goreman, it's just com- the complete opposite of that, and I think that that's why it really stands out, is because it truly feels like the movie that you would find as a kid and just immediately gravitate towards. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's such a goofy sort of sensibility to it. But again, like, I feel like a majority of the ways I'm describing it don't do it justice in terms of just like, again, how well balanced all of these um, sort of elements are and how the movie really, it really leans into its influences scene by scene. And yet it all feels so, not flippant, but it's just, it feels so nonchalant about pursuing this very strange, very weird sort of humor and the obviously the gore and stuff we've been talking about and yet it all really is seamless in the blending at the end of the day when you talk about like the full circle experience of the film and yeah i think that we like of course i love films that have lots of sort of social commentary and they deal with real world issues but yeah once in a while it's nice to kind of kick back and watch a movie that just revels in the fact that it can be goofy and silly and bloody and hilarious all of these different things that I think we were much more accustomed to receiving on a regular basis and now they almost feel like a reward of some sort but i guess the fear would be like in describing a film like that people maybe that aren't as hardcore genre fans as you and i are they might be like well that just sounds like a waste of time or something to that extent whereas i mean everybody needs a genre palette cleanser or just a palette cleanser in general once in a while and this is one of those movies that i think really reminds you that at the core movies are supposed to be fun and enjoyable and it's like you don't have to put a ton of thought into them all the time and yet they can still be these rewarding personable experiences yeah it's it's entertainment you know sometimes sometimes maybe i want filet mignon you know (laughs) nice nice steak bacon wrapped like some sometimes it's what i want and and you're gonna get that with movies like the invisible man or something along those lines or hereditary or midsummer whatever uh but other times i i want fucking taco bell you know (laughs) and to me and to me, Psycho Gorman is Taco Bell. It satisfies that that just greasy, bad for you craving that that we have, right? Something that I find kind of funny too, as I'm thinking about it, and we're talking about how 
the movie just consistently maintains just that fun kind of never really gets too in the weeds kind of vibe to it is that when you watch this film part of the effect that the character Mimi has that I think is great is that it really brings you back to I think the sensibility of being a kid and watching mm -hmm. stuff like this mm -hmm. you know in the sense that you mentioned before how like all these characters feel like they have this great backstory to them and there's you know this rich universe of possibilities with Psycho Gorman but the thing about the film is that every time we start to get even a little bit into that <laughs> Mimi kind of pops in with boring and you know yeah. like, and, and and moves the story along and I just think that's brilliant because you know as kids who who of us was sitting around saying I need to know more about you know Psycho Gorman's time on this planet or whatever. No, we just we just couldn't wait to see him rip another head off or something, right? Um, and so I, I think that's part of why the pacing works so well is that Mimi is just there to consistently like bring us back into the movie instead of letting Psycho Gorman go too much off on this tangent of <laughs> of any sort of backstory or reality to it, right? So. Well, again, for like how unrestrained the film is in most regards, the storytelling aspect, I feel, is very restrained in never allowing it to get too off the tracks. Because then, yeah, then we're delving into these much longer than needed sort of backstories. And I think it's it's more interesting to make a film that is um, kind of it's like environmental storytelling or in this regard it'd be like creature design storytelling rather mm. than actually trying to like flesh out. Pandora's entire backstory past what we get, right? Or even Psycho Goreman, like it, he is a very kind of just simplistic, you've heard it before sort of rise to power type story. And yet it's perfect for what it needs to do. And if it was any longer, right? You would want a Mimi type character to show up and be like, boring, let's get on to the next like head rip off or whatnot. And I think that again, like for a movie that is so unrestrained in a lot of ways, he just has a fantastic temperament about him in terms of storytelling doing what he wants to do and then being able to capitalize it on a way that doesn't bring like the entire thing to a grinding halt. Cause this is right. one of those movies where I was like, if this movie had 10 or 15 minutes extra of exposition, it would be one of those things where I was like, do I really need to know the backstory on the brain other than uh, it being their friend, <laughs> Alistair? Like if they, yeah. if he was a character that wasn't their friend and we like, do we need to know his entire backstory? Probably not. So it's very just, it's, it speaks to somebody that, again, you like you were saying about him kind of coming back to the style of filmmaking that he wants. It's very yeah. evident that even if maybe he had done these sort of like a studio project here or a film where he had to collaborate with somebody else, he's very, you can tell that he has learned a lot in every film that he's made. And I'm sure oh. if you go back and watch uh, Manborg or something, you'll see hints of Psycho Gorman in that. And yet I would, I'm sure it would be a more, this would be a more refined version of that. Oh, 100%. Yeah, no, he, he's absolutely learned quite a bit since the days of Manborg. <laughs> Were there any other kind of just like elements of the film that uh, we didn't touch upon that really stand out to you? I mean, it's such a simple film, but it's such a unique film in a lot of ways. Well, I did, I did have one more comment about just just kind of the way the story plays out is that I, I think that, you know, I think that there's a lesson to be learned here for a lot of filmmakers in terms of what the audience does and doesn't need to know. You know, because Kostansky, he just has what feels like this inherent ability to know exactly how much we need to care and keep the story going and and, and when to cut back from that because you know you we keep mentioning this this movie is only 90 minutes long right but you feel like you have a great understanding of not just a few characters but like you know there, there's like 20 characters in this where i feel like i really get all of them right and and yet you can see these two and a half hour epics where there's all this world building going on, but you can sometimes leave the movie feeling like, well, I still don't really get the character though, because I didn't I didn't see the character being who they are. I just got a lot of backstory on them, you know? And and so that's something that does really well. As far as like other elements that that really stand out, I, I, one thing I guess I will mention is the family dynamic. I, I really love that, you know, that all of those characters got their own kind of life in the film as well, you know? Uh, actually, it's kind of interesting, Adam Brooks, who plays the dad, I don't know why this is the case, but on the commentary, Kostansky mentions that uh, he wouldn't have, he might not have even done this film if Brooks hadn't agreed to do it. <laughs> hmm. And I guess that part of that is because the dad character, admittedly on the first watch, was was funny to me, but didn't feel completely necessary. 
but as I've watched the film a few more times, you kind of realize that like Adam Brooks's character is actually like essential to the movie. <laughs> and and I guess that, you know, he just, Cascancy couldn't see anybody else playing him but Brooks. And I sort of get wise because Adam Brooks is kind of like, you know, everybody else in the family is just very accepting of Psycho Gorman and just like, okay, he's, we just have a monster in our lives now. No big deal. You know, the mom's going out and watching him try on clothes and everything. <laughs> like, and, and, and Adam Brooks is the one who kind of grounds the movie in just how ridiculous all of this really is. Like I, <laughs> one, one moment that just fucking kills me is when he's just sitting on the couch watching TV and all of a sudden like the, the flaming skull or whatever it is comes crashing through, <laughs> comes crashing through the room and into the wall behind him. He's just like, oh shit, fuck, what? <laughs> and then, and then it, it just, the camera just holds on him for like a straight minute of him just curled up into a ball and just kind of like sobbing because he's just like, why am I living through this right now, you know? Um, so, so I think it's that. I think it's, you know, we've talked a lot about the comedy, but I think just the the way that the comedy interacts with the mundane, I think is what is what really, really works well for this movie with me. You know, even the even the moment when uh, when they need to rescue Psycho Gorman, you know, you could have all sorts of ways that you do this and all sorts of uh, settings for Psycho Gorman to contact the dad to, you know, come help them out. And of everything that Kaskansky could have chosen from, he chooses to have Adam Brooks sitting on the goddamn can <laughs> <laughs> as as this just horrible, monstrous, flaming Psycho Gorman face just pops up in front of him and starts screaming at him. It's not It's not just like a casual like hey we need your help it's oh, get over here now we're all gonna die <laughs> like it's you know it's just so extreme and, and i think that's what that's that's a big part of what works so well in this movie is just placing this really extreme comedy into just such mundane moments as like taking a dump you know it's <laughs> i mean yeah that really reinforces the idea that this is it's basically kostanski just being like hey this movie's getting pretty nutty. Remember, this is all for fun kind of thing. And I think that that contrast is really important. And again, it avoids, not that I think Kosansky has a certain sensibility, but he never takes himself too seriously. And the film really shows that, right? At no point, there aren't like long stretches of the film where it's just Psycho Goreman being a monster and uh, eviscerating his foes and things like that. It really is snapping you back to reality with those human characters. And I definitely would agree in terms of like, the first time I watched the film, I was like, the father's kind of just like this schlubby dude that doesn't really need to be here. And then on the rewatch, I was like, oh, well, actually, he is all of us watching in a lot of ways. And that is really great. Yeah, it's like um, it's like in the same way that it's like in the same way that Psycho Gorman enhances the, you know, the the fun and the just craziness of this family's lives, the same way that they kind of ground him into reality a bit right mm. and, and kind of ground the the insanity of everything that's going on because you know like a good example of that is the the end of the movie where if you've if you've watched anything with characters like psycho gorman or if you grew up on these 90s cartoons or whatever right you you don't you expect some massive monster battle in the end you know you just you're you, like at, your kid mind is blowing up to like oh yeah we've got to have this 10 minute extreme sword fight or whatever the hell's gonna go on and, and what does Kostansky do he he has them playing dodgeball right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and it just it's a way to just really kind of ground the fantasy of it all and and kind of in a way make it feel more real you know and, and I think that's I, I lost track when talking about the family but I think that's why I love that element of the story too is that you know, the whole family just really kind of brings it all down to earth and makes it feel like Psycho Gorman and these characters are really there and really exist, you know? Because um, it's not monsters battling, it's monsters playing dodgeball. <laughs> right. uh, and it just, it make, again, it makes it feel more human and family friendly and fun, you know? Yeah, and I mean, there's that fantastic full circle-ness from obviously how the film begins, but then also I love how they go from that to oh okay we the day has been won and then normally a cartoon like that ends with the day has been saved and yet Psycho Gorman goes on a killing spree in some other area and it's like the fact that again the kind of 
adult swim sensibilities in terms of the humor of the film it nobody really addresses it none of the characters are like oh he's just gonna go kill a bunch of people or yeah. they kind of just never address the fact that alistair is stuck in the brain form now and that's how the film ends is that shot sure. and i just love how he doesn't feel the need to have characters address everything that happens because it's so insane how could you even address it really yeah, I, mean, I mean, what are you going to say? Psycho Gorman's a, a Godzilla-sized monster now destroying cities. Like, whoops. I mean, that's, yeah. that's all I can really say, which I, I love that moment when that happens where, uh, you know, Mimi is making him promise that he's not going to kill all of them. And, and he does. And she, you know, agrees to give him the gem. And then the dad is just like, uh, and are you, are you going to make him promise? Like, what about the rest of the people in the world? And Mimi's just like, oh, yeah whoops whoops <laughs> is right <you> know? <laughs> but that but that's it it just ends there and then it's like okay well now now it's like a man's gonna go murder everybody but hey we're good <laughs> it's one of those things where i love that the film is so self-contained right because of course i think at the end he rounds out the interview that you did with him and saying like oh i would be open to making another one but in before to go back to like before the show you and i were talking about how one of the things that we kind of took issue with with the new Mortal Kombat was is that you can feel like that movie is made in a lot of ways for sequels, right? You feel like yep. it's made with that in mind. And it's so incredibly refreshing to watch a movie like this, Psycho Goreman, that is so self-contained and yet that you can feel the potential for a sequel if there was one, if he wanted to go off and make one. And that is just something that's so rare and I'm so appreciative of in a film that, hey, we could get another one of these in three or four years or we could never get another one and yet nothing is taken away from the film in that regard. It just feels so self-contained and so, and it it sets out, it achieves what it sets out to. And that's something that I find very refreshing. And again, like, especially during the pandemic, people have said online uh, stuff like, oh, there's nothing to watch or there's nothing new to watch. And it's like, well, this is a perfect example of something that you've never seen anything like. It's new, it's entertaining, and it's its own thing. It's not just the setup for something else. And you know what? I've, I've started to wonder if that attitude is a symptom of what you just described, which is the idea that, you know, a lot of movies now are made for the movie that's coming after it and not this movie. You know, and, and I think it's like you, you mentioning how refreshing that is. You know, I just had to sit back for a second and think like how how much of a shame that 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 we even need that refreshment. Right. You, you know, Absolutely. how much of a shame that is, because like for for anyone listening you know I, I i was born in 87 i grew up in the 90s and back then people you know we we watched movies that actually ended mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that weren't being you know put out just for the movie to come after it right and and i think that you know i, I almost feel sorry for anyone who has grown up in the late 90s 2000s where it feels like so much content that's put out now isn't really you know allowing the focus to be on that particular piece but also having all of this thought going into like well what's going to come in the next one and then what's going to come five movies down the line from that i mean the entire marvel universe has been planned out for god what like 15 20 years right <laughs> and, and every movie is just made to build up for the next one you know and and yeah so that that you know as sad as it is that we even have to feel this way that was what's refreshing about psycho gorman is even though you can see all the potential for future installments and and because there's all this backstory left that we don't know like you could absolutely go there hell i i would watch a psycho gorman cartoon you know yeah uh, you could do so much with it but at the end of the day it's all compacted into the movie like everything that we need for this story to be complete is there we don't we don't really need the next chapter as much as we might want it. <laughs> and and yeah it is, you're right it's it's a shame that you know that that's kind of like the general standard though is you're just waiting for the next one moral comments a great example we've watched that not really self-contained though we're already kind of waiting for like okay well what happens next because there's clearly more you're building up to so. <laughs> i will say like the horror genre specifically though seems to avoid that problem a lot and i don't know if it's it because does. I don't know if it's maybe because like, again, horror still does not get the uh, acclaim that it deserves amongst like the other other genres and things like that. Or maybe they feel like they can take more risks because maybe the budget is typically not as high as 
action movies or whatever have you um, mm-hmm. or superhero movies obviously um, so maybe they feel like they can take more risks but I'm always I think Psycho Gorman is a fantastic example that the horror genre really can take risks on these weird ideas I mean Psycho Gorman is a weird idea for a movie and it's if you were to pitch that it would sound very strange it's like oh could they actually pull this off and sort of draw from all these different influences in a way that is a homage but still entertaining and still not taking itself too too seriously but mm. horror in general, I find they, of course, always have like maybe a, a mini stinger or something at the end, like, oh, this character is not dead or there's the potential for this. But I very rarely find that I have the problem like I had with Mortal Kombat or something like that, as if it was a, uh, in the horror film uh, that I'm usually watching. So right. that's something that I think the genre definitely does better than most. Oh, for sure. You know, I mean, one of the one of the advantages, I guess, that horror has there is that, you know, horror is typically not these big stretched out epic stories right you know it's not (laughs) it's not the marvel universe it's not you know those things it's it they generally are kind of smaller stories and and i think the key too with a lot of horror movies is that you know the villain is the character that we're coming for right and and in horror we expect the villain to be showing up for sequels down the line (laughs) so so there i think there's less pressure on you know, setting certain things up when you know that the primary character that you need to keep alive is the villain who's going to be coming back anyway. You know, as opposed to something like Marvel where it's like, well, I can't really kill off Captain America because I need <laughs> Captain America for like six more movies, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, but what, when I watch Halloween, it's like, okay, you like even Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, if Laurie dies and Halloween kills, that's okay. You know, like it, it'll be sad, but you don't, need Laurie for three movies if that makes any sense (laughs) yeah I think I'm thinking about it in terms more less of characters and more of just time that is spent developing a story of some sort right because there are so many of these films like uh, again like Mortal Kombat not to keep uh, ragging on that because I think that (laughs) obviously you and I were talking like the kills and the violence and stuff that they were able to bring to the silver screen from the games I think is fantastic but Mm -hmm. again like how much of the time where characters are interacting and speaking with one another do you feel like it's they're just kind of like sitting there kind of twiddling their thumbs like none of this actually matters because it is a big exposition dump for a much larger yeah. story? I got what you're saying, yeah. Every, everything's always about the future. <laughs> right. It's all about the future and it just feels like a waste of time. Whereas I very rarely find, I mean, Psycho Gorman, again, is a great example of they tell you just enough that you need to understand the universe and the characters and they give them lots of interesting things to do and to say and kill one another and whatnot but you still see the potential for the future rather than kind of like leaving things so open-ended that you feel like they didn't actually explain enough or they didn't give you enough of a character to get a genuine appreciation for them. I mean, I, I think, I think you hit it right on the head is that, you know, again, like look at Mortal Kombat, right? This is, this is a two hour film. I feel like I barely know those characters. <laughs> the, a, any sense I have of those characters comes from just years of loving Mortal Kombat, right? If you just take on the surface what the film gives you, you get like a smidge of who that person really is. Because like you said, like everything's kind of about the tournament and exposition and explaining things and moving things forward. And going back to like Gore Man, 90 minute movie, you get just the little bits that you need of exposition and everything else is just letting the characters be the characters. So. Yeah, and I kind of, I mentioned uh, like environmental storytelling earlier and this film does such, Psycho Gorman does such a great job of just letting you get to know the characters through their actions, right? It's kind of like showing rather than telling you about everybody and what you're told about them, it's 90 seconds or less in terms of just backstory and things like that. And I think that that really is, again, a testament to Kostansky's uh, filmmaking in that he's able to, uh, to allow the viewer to occupy this space and observe what is happening in terms of like how characters are uh, reacting to one another, like seeing how the parents are reacting to Psycho Goreman, seeing how the kids are. And you just mm-hmm. get a really great sense of everyone that's in the film. And you don't need to know more than what you are uh, able to learn from their actions and things, because it, it is in service of that self-contained story. And yeah, it's a movie that is insanely rewatchable. I was kind of curious, like how rewatchable it would be. And I think I've seen it now three times. Um, and it is stupidly rewatchable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when I when I was getting ready to interview Kostansky, I think I watched it like four times in two days. And and even after that, I was like, you know, I, I, I could go for another watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
It's just it's just one of those movies that I can have it on the background all the time if I want it. I just you can never get sick of it. Yeah, so definitely check out Psycho Goreman uh, while it's on video on demand if you're able to. And uh, if for whatever reason you can't, it is coming to Shudder on May 20th. So definitely check it out. Not only does uh, Matt highly recommend it, but I do as well. It's probably one of the most memorable movies of the last few years for me, at least. And it sounds like definitely for you. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I, <laughs> I'm one of those people where every time I see someone mentioning uh, this or that movie as the best movie of 2021, I'm in my head screaming, "Nope, Psycho Goreman, <laughs> the only contender." <laughs> it's definitely a movie that I think it taps into not only nostalgia, but then he also just impresses with his ability to juggle multiple genre influences, all of these things, and it's it's a remarkable film. And I was happy to uh, be able to have you on for a second time to chat about it. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's just uh, it's it's a film that I'm excited to see the legacy of. Like, I, I hope I live long enough to, you know, to see the effects that Psycho Gorman hopefully has on the younger generation that's going to grow up with it. You know, because it, it's it's why I keep saying that I to me it's the best is that, you know, there are a lot of great films releasing. There always are, uh, and and we're gonna you know we'll still be talking about Mortal Kombat probably in a few years and stuff like that, but. I think that you can sense with Psycho Gorman that this is a movie that is going to span generations, right? Like, as long as it finds the life that it needs to, that's a film that I can see kids, you know, enjoying again and again for, like, decades. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one of those movies that we hope doesn't kind of, like, fall to the wayside, and I think that it coming to Shudder will help people that maybe, for whatever reason, like, didn't check it out when it came out originally, or maybe it's something that they would never seek out. And it's something that, you know, it like pops up on Shutter TV or whatever. And it's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. That kind of resembles sort of uh, elements of my childhood. And then that is what gets them to watch it and kind of just influence a whole new generation of people to remember like, we don't always have to, horror should not be synonymous with cynical, right? There's many different types of stories to tell, many different sort of vibes and things that you can put into a horror film. And this is one of those films that reminds us all that. And it, uh, it hopefully will have a, large influence on the genre for many years to come. Yep, fingers crossed. <laughs> Thanks again, Matt. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, man. This was uh, the heckin' best now. Freak off. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service and follow the show on Instagram at Daily Horror Habit and on Twitter at Daily Horror Pod for episode updates. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.